I work in the security intelligence uh, um, division of IBM Security. So Mahesh is uh, my peer, and uh, so I. Uh, this was two years ago when people were talking about cognitive and all that. Um, IBM had a huge mission to make everything cognitive. And uh, it was also shout down our throat to pursue something that's cognitive and security. At that time when we began this project, it never occurred to me that we could use something like Watson for doing security analytics. Okay. Nevertheless, it got interesting and then we, we began pursuing, going down the path of uh, applying cognitive sciences and use it for security analytics. Um, for those of you who haven't heard about Watson, right? Watson is this umbrella of products where we use cognitive uh, things to uh, do multiple product lines. You probably heard about uh, Watson for Health, right? Uh, Watson for Health is basically Manipal Hospital uses it. Um, it, it. It basically is digesting a lot of information that is out there from clinical studies to um, to blogs to seminars to journals. So we all ingest the data into this huge machine called Watson. And what it does is it comprehends all that information, tries to understand the language of medicine, and tries to help a doctor diagnose a problem. So it's humanly impossible to stay on top of everything, right? And more so with the medicine because there's this latest research, there's latest clinical studies, and all that. Um, so especially in this part of the world, um, you know, I don't, I, I can't imagine doctors traveling lot to a lot of conferences. Uh, there's hindrances because of you know, economics themselves. Um, you probably don't have access to the latest clinical studies that's probably being done, sponsored in, in the United States or someplace. Um, so, so for them, it's really a great tool. You give, give Watson certain diagnostic information and it'll go dig through all this uh, millions and millions of documents. In a few minutes, it'll come up with uh, what it thought about you know that particular medical report that you got for a pet patient, and then you would it would it would basically come up with a line of treatment that would work for that patient, right? And and it doesn't mean that it's making the decision on behalf of a doctor, but what it's telling you is, okay, I looked at this information and I believe this is the right line of treatment, and doc the doctor could make the right decision. It, it's ultimately up to the doctor to make the decision. Okay, that's nothing to do with security, right? This is medicine. So same thing. Um, the problem of cybersecurity is interesting too. Um, we have a huge skill gap. Okay, we're looking for security analysts who are well versed with the latest attack patterns. You know, who are on top of the top of the technology uh, or on top of the game, understanding. You know, what's going on? What's the latest? Is it relevant to me? That kind of thing. So, it's it's a similar problem in that. You know, it's it's impossible to basically for someone to read, the, uh, um, you know, all security journals, um, you know, Lockheed ransomware or WannaCry, because you only get to know about it only after the fact, yeah. right? And it's it's very hard for a security analyst, and and let alone uh, for an incompetent one, it's 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 you you lose losing the game there. So, so the use case certainly applied to cybersecurity there as well, right? So we what we tried was we tried to ingest this. Um, huge amount of security journals, um, and if some malware was detected, obviously the first thing that will happen is somebody writes a blog about it. WannaCry, if you could imagine, and go search for it. Somebody would, would have explained how WannaCry unfolds, right? It's a ransomware, it encrypts your system, and then, um, and then somebody has to pay the ransom with, through bitcoins and then get their disk unencrypted. Uh, so somebody went and explained what are the typical indicators Right. What are, what are the hashes that you typically see with a, a WannaCry ransomware? Um, you know how it unfolds, how it spreads, what is the lateral movement, um, what is the exfiltration patterns, and things like that. So all of that is documented in a blog. So for a security analyst to basically say that yes, you are infected with WannaCry ransomware, he has to understand the pattern, and um, that's where Watson comes into picture. So if you tell Watson that. Um, you know, this is one accrual ransomware, these are the indicators, it tries to connect the dots, and given a behavior, it would, within a minute or so, come up with a pattern and say, yeah, by the way, I've seen this pattern which is connected to these malicious indicators, and these malicious indicators are 
related to a WannaCry ransomware. And then the security analyst can take a, um, um, a responsive action, right? So either patch it, remove it, things like that. Um, I'm going to show you a demo to make it more intuitive. Uh, but but the, I hope you get the point, right? So what Watson is and where we apply the same anal analogy with medicine to cybersecurity as well. So it's, it's basically what, I mean, from, from a cognitive perspective, right, we're trying to outpace, outlearn the security threat, um, security threats that we see every day to day with a more uh, cognitive pattern which learns, reasons, and responds to it, okay? And, and I stress upon the, the reasoning part because it's very easy to basically have a database of structured data which contains trillions and trillions of data, right? So many URLs are malicious, so many hashes are malicious, so many, so many domains are malicious. That kind of thing is good, but being able to reason behind it is what's cognitive all about. So you probably heard about firewalls, IPS, antivirus scanners, you probably have one installed on your laptops, right? So these are all silos. These are all parameter controls, which basically saying, okay, I won't let these things in, right? That's all parameter controls. And then what happened is people uh, wanted to go into a more mature model where they talked about secure intelligence, right? It's able to correlate stuff from different sources and able to raise an offense, which, uh, which basically goes through a lot of events, right? Because what happened is eventually as the industry matured, you had a lot of, lot of these security events happen. It's, these are not one or two or three events. These are tons of events happening every day. So it'll overwhelm anybody who is looking or manning the security operations center, especially at an enterprise level. If you look at any bank or any financial institutions, you're probably seeing close to you know, good, good 10,000 to 20,000 events an hour, actually. And for somebody to analyze um, each of those events is, is just not impossible and doesn't make sense at all. Some of them could just be somebody trying to do a recce on your system and uh, somebody trying to scratch on or knock on firewall does not mean anything, right? Because it hasn't gotten through the firewall. So, so to prioritize some of them and, and being able to, uh, you know, use the time properly Right, that's when the security intelligence came into picture. So you have this central piece where your uh, network endpoints, your firewalls, your IPS, your fraud detection systems, your identity and access systems, all of them are sending their events to. And then it's correlating the logs being sent by the applications as well. Right, That's what security intelligence was. Your SIEMs are essentially security intelligence equipment out there helping the centralized manned security operations center. Right, that's what is SIEM. Um, have you heard about QRadar before? QRadar, Splunk. Okay, so those are the SIEM type of controls that people use in a security operations center. Okay, um, that that was some some somewhere around you know late 2000s and and it, it was still popular a couple of years ago, right? And a lot of this intelligence that we're being built, right? That that they are essentially on top of these SIEM technologies. So, so two years ago, as I told you, we, we started doing cognitive security, which is basically interpret, learn, process security intelligence that was designed by and for humans at a speed scale that like never before, right? So all of this, when, when somebody mans a security operations center looking at QRadar or an SIEM, uh, these offenses for investigation takes a lot of time, and you don't have that many people looking at it, right? Even if you take the number of offenses that show up at a financial institution, there, there are a lot, a lot of them. So we had a skill gap, number one, because the analysts were never, I mean, we never had a really good analyst, uh, you know, who, who was top of his game, right? It was, it was very hard to get. There was a skill gap, not everybody were perceiving cybersecurity as a, as a career option, right? People wanted to become developers, engineers, big data, as whatever you told, right? Machine learning specialist, IoT specialist, but never, um, I, I don't hear, you know, from a lot of engineers that they would want to become a cybersecurity analyst, manning a SOC, right? And I don't know how many of you want to. Um, so I, I don't want to push you in that direction of career, but I would like to say that, you know, as hacking is more interesting, defending from hacking is equally interesting, right? So we don't see passion in some of these security analysts. I mean, we have uh, about 7,000 people sitting in our second floor EGL block, 
who are actually manning the security operation center for customers, right? So they're looking at Equifax uh, offenses, and you know what happened with Equifax a couple of years ago, or six months ago, or something like that. So, um, you know, they're, they're looking at constant events coming up or offenses showing up on Curator for these customers and trying to evaluate what's going on. Some of these are real offenses. Some of these are uh, probably trivial or probably defended by an existing infrastructural element. So there you go. So we, we come, came up with this uh, cognitive security element, which is part of the SIEM, which is able to learn uh, reason and uh, react to, to a particular offense and learn from it. As I proceed through these slides, right, it's, it's, some of this is meant for uh, marketing material. So, you know, I'll, I'll probably talk more about stuff like what would it take to build a cognitive system versus uh, what we're trying to sell, okay? Um, so when we began this project, uh, we had to teach Watson the language of cybersecurity, right? When we began on a clean slate, we asked Watson what the ransomware is. It would come back and say, yeah, it's a city with a population of, you know, 200,000 people. Uh, uh, you know, to its benefit, right? So there, there are seven cities in the U.S. which are called ransom, and it probably confused with, with, with that. Um, and then we started ingesting data. As, prop, prop, as part of ingestion, right, what we do is um, we, we, we actually take a document uh, we have something called Watson Knowledge Studio. We load the document into Watson Knowledge Studio. These are all the tools that basically help in identifying the relationships um, before ingesting into the system called Watson. Um, we load this document into Watson Knowledge Studio, annotate stuff, right? Annotation is basically um, take the entities. You have, you, you have WannaCry which we identified as ransomware, and we defined what ransomware is, which is a malware family, right? And then we, we kind of tell what a ransomware would involve. It would encrypt a disk, and it would hold you at ransom. That's what ransomware does. And uh, one of the uh, course of action or action and objectives would, would, for a ransomware would essentially be, um, be somebody browsing through an Onion browser and paying um, paying the guy who hold you, who held you at ransom, uh, with bitcoins, and that's if you if you notice all that behavior, it's it's very typical with a ransomware pattern. Okay, um, so going back to annotation, so if we take these uh, you know verbs, um, the things like malware, hashes, um, URLs, domains, we annotate them as part of the document, and you don't have to annotate it for each and every document. It's the initial process was was the toughest part because you need to tell what's and what cybersecurity's uh, terms and language really was, right? Um, and uh, just like you learning what ran, you know what what cybersecurity terms are, we're teaching a machine to do the same thing. You probably have never heard about. Um, let me tell you this: uh, course of action, or exfiltration, right? Or um, what do you call? reconnaissance in cybersecurity aspects of it, right? So there are certain terms that are associated with cybersecurity, you know, that a machine would not probably know unless you teach it. So that was the annotation project, product. So we took all these blogs, um, Wikipedias, um, you know, structured data that we already were curating from, from our research right? All those materials were essentially text at some point. We started annotating that and ingested into this corpus called Watson. So after, uh, after, after probably ingesting about a million documents, uh, it was at a fair state. Now you ask what, what ransomware is, it would come back with an answer that would, that would be more in line with what a cybersecurity analyst would like to hear, right? Um, so and then we had this problem of, uh, you know, we ingested all these million documents. We are continuously ingesting the latest blogs, latest feeds that we're getting from security, um, security um, research and all that. Um, and then we had this problem of, you know, too much of data. If you ask something, it was throwing a lot of connections with us, right? So when we ask about a hash, uh, that hash probably reincarnated into multiple malwares, right? People usually copy and build malware on top of it. They don't essentially start on a, on a clean slate, right? The people share data. 
So if a malware could, you know, essentially beat our defenses, enter the enterprise and start spreading, they would use the same, uh, same methodology for building a newer ransomware. Probably tweak a little bit so, you know, your existing frameworks cannot catch it. One such defense is the, uh, the DGA thing. So we have these um, WebSyn software, we have these firewalls, we have these um, IPS devices sitting in the infrastructure where we're putting rules saying, okay, don't allow these domain names, don't allow these uh, categories of URLs which are known to be malicious, right? We all do that. Um, th that's, 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 you know, how, so what, what the ransomware guys do is, in order to have these command and control, again, a newer term, command and control is basically establishing a foothold in, inside the enterprise and communicating with something that's outside the network and being able to control within, you know, perform certain things within inside the network, right? That's what command and control is. Um, in order to do command and control, you need to bypass these protections or get past the firewalls and IPS. So they use a methodology called DGA, a domain ge domain name generation algorithm. So it comes up with abcdef12345.com and you have this domain translated to certain IP address, but that domain isn't classified to be malicious because nobody knows about it. It's a very randomly generated domain name, right? If you go to Xforce Exchange and, and query this domain name, you probably find, won't find any entry in it, just because it's dynamically degenerated and, and you have this uh, fast, fast flux domains, right, which are changing the IP addresses pretty fast, right? So, so that, that was one of the symptoms of, uh, uh, of, of typical ransomware. Um, and, and we all have to teach Watson about it. And as I told you, this, this, you know, when you when you asked Watson certain things, it was throwing too much information, and and our customers always hated having too much thrown at them, right? You tell me what's happening. Don't tell me that this could be happening, and and give me a million possibilities because you're making their lives much more tougher by throwing data at them. Um, so what we had to do was, apart from just using this cognitive corpus and asking Watson, we had to um, somehow marry the data with our structured corpus. Our structured corpus would actually mean um, a specified structure, you know, pattern for security data. For example, if you give, um, Xforce Exchange is one of these research uh, databases that we have, and if you give it a URL, a domain name, it would classify that into a certain category, and it's it's slam dunk for most of the analysts because if if it tells that this is malware, it is malware, right? They don't have to go research and figure out if if a particular file with a certain hash is a malware, right? Otherwise, they would end up doing sandboxing, figuring out from endpoint software whether this is this has modified registries, this has played around with certain file systems and all that, right? It it it, it takes a lot more time, so. So what we did was we, we took that security data that we were already building and married with what Watson would, was, was saying and, and came up with this cognitive software that would actually help the security analyst sitting before a, uh, SIEM to zero in and on incident. All right, something for you to, you know, trying to make this more impressive, right? So what did we achieve after... Uh, we used Watson, right? We, we gain powerful insights because certain connections are not, you know, imagine a file, imagine an attachment that you get, right? Uh, do you still get .exe attachments? You probably don't, right? People have gotten smarter and they don't send you .exes anymore. They're sending you a PDF file or probably a, a Word document from a legitimate source like your professor sending you an email saying, here are your grades or whatever. And uh, there are macros inside that Excel document or, or uh, Word document, that would install um, a JavaScript. It doesn't have to do, uh, you know, an installation of a real malware binary. If you look at how WannaCry or Locky spreads, um, it installs a JavaScript. It's a .js file. That's all it is. And you have to run it in a browser. Um, and all what it does is it would basically connect to a URL and download the exe for you. Wget, simple, right? So when you look at .js file in an attachment, or if a, mic, if a macro executes that, you probably won't notice it. And your, uh, you know, email servers, which are probably running, uh, you know, malware scans, cannot detect it either. So, um, so to be able to see this connection that you got an email from some recipient, 
uh, or from from some source and this has an attachment that executes a macro that downloads a js file that downloads the real exe and that exe copies itself into a registry so when you restart your your laptop you know it's restarting it, you know, it gets installed or whatever right and it renames itself um, and copies itself into your temp folder and it also would change certain properties of that binary so it would people would not know that it has been downloaded from internet right it's a matter of just editing a property on a binary it all happens right and um and to be able to connect the dots um it, it takes a real researcher to do that it's not possible for a uh, for a let alone a in a, a expert, right? So I'm even talking about the guys who are sitting before SIEM. It doesn't, they don't have a clue about what's happening because it's happening at an endpoint level. So to connect those dots and, and explore, uh, you know, the possibilities, it was humanly impossible. And that was one of the problems that cognitive security was trying to solve. Um, so it gave those connections, all those powerful insights that we would not be able to connect because when we ingested those relationships into Watson, what it did was it connected, suppose a hash was connected to another hash, uh, right, you know, your file may not be opening, may, may not be malicious, but a file, it may be opening another file which could be malicious. So all those connections are, are established within Watson and was able to come up with that. Obviously, you know, this happens within a minute or so and versus six months, you know, three to six months that an analyst would take to, to establish, you know, certain malware ha happening. Um, this was a famous um, case with Sony you know, they had the best of the cybersecurity analysts sitting before SOC. It took six months for them to figure out that something was happening, right? I mean, not because they had dearth of talent, but because, you know, it's humanly impossible to make those connections. And um, if they were using Watson to apply the, f I mean, obviously their SIEM was throwing up offenses saying, oh, this is happening, this is happening, this is anomalous. And that that's about it. If you look at any of these SOC, uh, entities, all they'll tell you that this is anomalous, this is out of the norm, things like that, right? But it doesn't tell you what's really happening, right? And 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 anomalous could as could be as simple as somebody emailing with with you know sending an email outside the network with code attached to it. It could be, you know, it's it probably need not be a jewel code that somebody's trying to exfiltrate. It could be you know simple. Um, in a for loop that somebody wanted to keep it in their email account or whatever, right? Things like that. So, yeah, there's a lot of noise, no doubt about it, when you when you look at an SIEM level, but to be able to narrow down to something that was more important, that was more connected to a malicious software was a lot more important, right? So, um, in order to save time and cost, uh, they had to use this cognitive security element as part of the SIEM. They talk about ingestion. We talked about annotation. So you ha you, you hear these words in, in the cognitive world anyway. So I mean, it's good for you to understand, you know, what what annotations are, what ingestion really means, what learning is, what reasoning is, and what experience that would that you would get from building a system called cog, you know, Watson system that that would resemble like Watson. Um, have you seen any videos before on Watson? You did. Some of them, at least. Some of you guys know? Okay. All right, you should, you should try Googling it. Do you have, uh, if you're connected to the internet, just Google, you know, Watson for health or something like that, and you would see a good video. Um, I mean, some of that is exaggerated for sure because it's not the same Watson that played Jeopardy that we are using to build cybersecurity, right? It's an umbrella where we are calling any cognitive solution as Watson. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's, it, It'll give you an idea where things are, because what, what happens in IBM is we set a target saying, uh, you know, two years down the line, three years down the line, we have this intelligent machine. You ask a question, it'll answer the question. You know, it'll answer it appropriately, right? And, and it's nice. So, you 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 know, you have this SIEM, you, you press this Ask Watson button, it'll tell you, okay, it'll give you the answer that you want, right? Key in an IP address and ask Watson about it, it'll probably throw up all the relationships, you know, the who is data and all that. I'll get all that kind of thing. So, so in order to build a system like that, we had to ingest threat databases, research reports, security textbooks, vulnerability disclosures, popular websites, blogs, and social activity. And and then these have to be continuously ingested because security about security is all about staying on top of the game, right? Because all these things keep changing, 
uh, a hash that was detected five years ago is no longer relevant. You need to be uh, able to track the latest hashes, uh, latest URLs, latest domain names that are malicious. Um, so you're con continuously ingesting this thing because we have annotated it already. It's able to process this data at a, at a, at a good pace and being and, and able to connect the dots or connect the relationships automatically inside that system. And what about learning? So we have this rich dictionary that, that we already ingested as part of annotation into Watson to link all uh, relationships. So if you look at a threat name, right? So call it Zeus or call it um, WannaCry. You know, if you, if you say this is a hash connected to WannaCry, and these are indicators of compromises and, and you know you have this binary associated with it. Uh, it's able to link those elements together. Um, and then we, we basically, um, so this is, this is an interesting slide, right? So we took Lockheed ransomware, it's, it's something like WannaCry, which had uh, multiple reincar reincarnations. And what it would do is it encrypts the files and you have to pay the ransom in order to decrypt, get the decryption key. Um, and Zeus would steal your bank credentials. Um, you know, you, you basically are giving it a behavior, a related verb, and you're actually introducing a rule that would, um, you know, detect that. So that's how Watson picks up, right? So what the, the you, you take the annotation logic, you apply annotators, annotators to a text, and then you get this huge graph called knowledge graph. And knowledge graph is, is, a, is a very common term that we use these days. It's basically a graph database. Have you heard, have you read graph theory? I think you're in third year, right? You must have gone through it, right? You know it's edges. Yes. Okay, have you worked with any graph databases? Neo4j? Neo4j? Very good, at least you understand what that is. Okay, so Titan, heard about it? Titan, yeah. So those are all graph databases. Graph databases are basically um, you know, redoing your 12th grade again, right? Because uh, you, you learned about permutation combination graphs in 12th grade, I guess, right? If you have three, um, okay, let's, let's start with a question to make this interesting. So if you have a pentagon, how many diagonals are possible with a pentagon? Diagonals are possible with a pentagon. You all wrote some entrance exam, right? No? What do you write, neat? No, you don't sound neat. What is it called? CET. Do you write C to get it, to get in here? Yeah. So how many diagonals are possible in a square? Two. Very good. With a pentagon. How about an octagon? Definitely more, right? So yeah. Obviously, you haven't read the permutations and combinations. So basically, any any side that's not okay. Any any line that's n connecting the edges, connecting the nodes. So how many uh, corners do you have in a square? Four, right? So how many lines can you draw between four, uh, four points? Two points? Two points, you can only draw one line. So in order to draw a line, you need two points. So, so in order to draw a line between four points, uh, four different points, you get six lines, right? So and there are four sides. So if you remove number of lines minus four, you'll get the number of diagonals. So same thing, you, you extrapolate that to however many, many points you have. With Pentagon, you have five points. So f five combination of, five require, you know, five with a combination of two points, if I see two, right? Minus five is the answer for anything, right? So, so graph theory is essentially the same thing. So you have nodes and you have edges connecting them, right? So if you use, um, if you use a graph database, what do you do to query a data graph database? What is it called? The term is called traversal, right? You start at certain point, traverse through nodes, and figure out the connections, right? So it's, it, it's interesting where we are taking this fundamental thing like graphs and trying to solve the problem of cybersecurity because uh, you have these nodes which, are, which, are, which have certain properties. The node could be a hash. The node could be a URL, the node could be a domain name, the node could be a malware itself. And in order to get from one point to the other, right, in order to establish a hash connects to a malware, you may have to go through multiple hops. That's called traversal. If you do an intelligent traversal and, and are able to get to a malware, obviously this hash connects to the malware. If there's no path, then 
it's not connected, right? So you, you've heard about paths, traversals, okay? So it's, it's, all, it's all being applied here in order to solve a real world problem. Okay, so, so pay attention to your teacher who's teaching you graph databases. All right, so now we, we thought Watson, what, um, what, the, what the, uh, the latest vulnerabilities meant, what the latest malware does, and annotated and ingested millions of documents into it. So now if you ask a question, what vulnerabilities are relevant to a crypto locker infection, it would, it would basically search the corpus that we have ingested and, and extract evidence, score and weigh, and actually give you those relationships. When you look at it, it may be like three uh, different vulnerabilities that are associated with crypto locker, but if you click on each of them, it would connect to the real evidence, meaning where did it get that information from? You know, it was probably from one blog, it pro probably from the structured database that was ingested into Watson, things like that. So this, this machine has already learned the, the, the technique of analyzing stuff to dig the information that we need for fetching the vulnerabilities related to CryptoLocker. All right, so again, this is all why cyber, uh, why cognitive security, right? So if you have the human generated knowledge is, is growing, it's something that you can impart and you have to probably teach a machine to do that. You know, the cognition part, right? Reasoning and learning. If, if you learn that something has happened, if you learn that a malware copies into a temp directory and does certain things, next time around if you're infected with virus, what do you do? You look for certain things. I mean, I do this, right? So you're, I don't, I don't, if I forget to renew my antivirus scanner, or antivirus license, what do I do? I try to remove malware myself, and what do I do to do that? I go search for certain EXEs that got installed, right? And we all do that, we'll do that, right? And then delete it, what's getting started, go edit the, the startup, and then delete the, you know, change the, modify the startup things, because th this is what a, a typical malware does. It modifies your startup uh, process, it modifies your registry, things like that. So you go edit, clean it up yourself if you're, if you don't have a, if you don't have, ren if you have not renewed your antivirus license, um, so that human-generated knowledge is is you know something that we are trying to help teach Watson, you know, to connect the dots, uh, to see certain behaviors and traits that are very typical with their malware, um, and it's growing, right? So this this, this data is growing by the day. Uh, I, I know because I ingested this XFP or X4 Exchange research data into graph database. This was close to, just just loan for hashes, we are ingesting close to about 200,000 documents every hour, okay? And and you can't imagine somebody, you know, being on top of it, right? So it's a lot of data. That is growing and, and um, you know, some of that falls off the radar because people are no longer using that technique. Um, so we have, uh, again, this is a good good point there, right? So a typical organization can only leverage up to eight percent of this content. So which really is talking about, you know, there's so much of data out there, big data, right? This is not about big data. Um, it's, it's so much data out there, and being able to uh, learn all that reason and then act upon it um, is humanly impossible. And hence, Watson is there for you. Okay, this was, again, uh, this is something that we try uh, and explain people like why cognitive security, right? I look at an offense, uh, I do certain searches on Google, I searches on, I do some search on, um, um, you know, known databases, virus total and things like that and I'm able to get that information. So why do I need Watson? And uh, we ask the same question, you know, how long do you take to uh, do an analysis of a particular reference that occurred at a SOC level? Um, and uh, usually, right, they, they say an hour, two hours, you know, 15 minutes, things like that. But the real um, malwares that infect or zero-day threats that happen, right, it, it takes a lot of time for them. Most of the cases, they probably won't even come up with, with an answer for their fence. They won't close their fence for six months because they have no clue what's going on. Um, and and it's a constant race and they're also overwhelmed because you know you probably employ like four or five guys to look at your SOC um, because you always think that nobody's going to attack me you know we have these firewalls we have these IPSs so it's not going to happen so you know you don't invest your resources um, in, in just looking at offenses that are happening unless you're a banking system right because if it hits a banking system you're losing money um, but if it hits a university like you it probably does not cause a lot of impact so 
all the more reason you know you use a corpus like Watson to to minimize the costs and minimize the uh, the time that takes for anybody to look at um, look at an offense. So uh, what I'll try and do is I'll try to give you a perspective of what happens in a security operations center, right? So this is our curator product, and it's all like make believe thing. Okay, um, so I can't show you a live demo because uh, you have to be connected to an IBM network. So I, I'll play a recorded demo which would talk about where this cognitive security came in from, you know, what, what it tries to solve. Um, this is a, a typical medium uh, enterprise where, uh, you know, certain things are being thrown at uh, the SOC analyst. Um, there's sus suspicious action from a document, you know, certain vulnerabilities, potential data leak, all these kinds of things, right? All, all it's telling you is um, it's potential, it's, it's anomalous, things like that. It's suspicious, that's it, right? It's not telling you that, oh, by the way, that suspicious action really relates to, uh, you know, installing a malware which would connect to this command and control server and would encrypt your system. It's not telling you that. It'll be, it'll be really useful for somebody that, you know, your attack has happened and it has gone through certain, because it usually does not happen in one shot. It, 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 it goes through a, something, for example, take a Mandiant life cycle, right? It installs, it establishes foothold, establishes communication with command and control server, then performs the action. Right, because if you if it happens so fast, your uh, what do you, what do they call it? The sandboxing equipment will catch it. Yeah. Right, so it's it's a defense against sandbox equipment. So the, the slow process of uh, you know establishing football, doing a lateral movement, uh, or you know how do you how how it spreads, how does it encrypt, takes takes the action, that kind of thing, um, is not detectable. But to tell an analyst that I have seen an action where it was talking to a command and control server, but haven't seen the exfiltration would, would mean a lot because that really means the attack hasn't succeeded, right? So if you look at any SIEM consoles, it's basically telling you that my rules have fired and and it's, it's a suspicious action and, and that's it. That's about it, it's suspicious. But it's not going as far as connecting the dots and actually telling what's happening. And that's the real job of a SOC analyst, to go behind it figure out the connections and, and raise a response, incident response ticket if they need to take an action on it, right? Enterprise type scenario, uh, scenario or so what, what, uh, what we did was we basically, detected a, a times, exploit, we basically detected a potential success. But a lot of times, as we said earlier with Raphael, you end up something right, with their document, and what then, event is there. Um, let's see what Watson said about it. So, um, it, so it, it took few of the observables or, uh, from the suspicious action document, you know, be it hashes, be it uh, um, the communications that, that, that were noticed. Um, and what, what happened was we gave it for analysis with Watson and Watson came back and determined Lockheed Malware family or kind of, uh, you know, that could be associated with this incident, right? Um, there are five other assets in the network that appear to be infected and it, it also found these additional indicators, um, you know, that could be related to this thing. So it basically zeroed in on a Lockheed Malware campaign. So that's the, the text part of it, right? That's, that's human telling you that, oh, I looked at the incident. By the way, it looks like Lockheed Malware. Let's go, you know, patch it or do something about it, right? That's exactly like a human talking or giving a response to you. It's just text, but you could imagine a, a voice behind it. So we did that. And Q-Rater is going to get a whole for, bunch of information for, for any security about it. analyst, you know, just you know, throwing something at them. You know, what is they, the host? They you know, what the network is it putting it on? Asked, is it right? sitting on the, the partner proof? network? Right. Maybe so a business owner? Or what you. kind of operating system okay. is this? Right. All so of that information we, gets pulled into here. And then but we're also um, seeing here that, you know, what the proof is. Uh, it is there. And this is this is Malware your graph family. database, right? We so see there's a bunch of documents at, that believes to be related um, to this. You know, so many attack um, campaigns as well, were found. Still, you know, there's a bunch still of the same information that was in the text. That are involved right? in this it didn't tell you how it part of this um, original suspicion. How it evolved to that conclusion. It found that there somebody downloaded an exe from scarpina.com, um, and then there are so many other assets that got impacted because they also were doing the same thing. Uh, I'll get to you a bit, you know, where you could make those connections, and this is a graph database, and try try to get this right, okay? Because um, you you need to be able to appreciate what you're learning in your graph theory. Now, as so it, it told all these why things. Watson believes so let's go back and look at on this single suspicious incident. From this is really good. We want to go floor insights. Okay, so I hope you can see those small things. But if you can't, um, the dot in the middle is the Lockheed Malware campaign. So what you see is that um, 
in the bottom you have a 10 dot ip address right which is your local laptop address which is communicated to certain ip addresses which were in I believe that's the russian flags the russian federation and then they have downloaded a year end dot xls which is the excel spreadsheet which installed an exe and and after that you saw a communication go to scarpina.com and it downloaded an exe which is related to locky um and you know you see the other 10 dot ip addresses um you know communicating with certain certain domains right which are also connected to locky right and you actually see the tar project there right you know what a tar project is so tar project is where you download the onion browser from that is right so onion browser is like an onion right you peel one at a time and you won't be able to understand what the communication is right so if you use a regular browser and connect to anything people can read it right even if it's encrypted you could do a man in the middle and read it onion browsers are uh, created to not um, to make it impossible to decrypt any to make it impossible to know what's happening what what websites are being hit so uh, bitcoins is all about secrecy right it's all uh, um, it follows blockchain but it's it's built on blockchain but it's more cryptocurrency nobody knows what's happening who owns it who's transacting no such thing right exactly it's all anonymous transactions so onion browsers help if you if you download onion browser and pay in bitcoins nobody would know that you have done that but the only thing that we were able to detect is somebody actually contacted the tar project which is not a good thing which really means they have downloaded onion browser from it and then they paid in bitcoins okay so go google it try to understand how this onion browser works what a tar project is uh, so you could become future hackers so what you see is a communication that 10.ip addresses um, you know communicating with with the tar project and and in the next screen or so you would actually see that one of the 10.ip IP address belongs to an intern which is not always a good thing that he's paying in bitcoins right so so that that gives you a picture right that gives you a context it's just not that watson determined the locky malware association it also showed certain behavior which were likely uh, to be you know associated with the locky or ransomware um, behavior right that that's what that is um and final state back. of watson what the advisor and watson are at the center of this um that's basic security to this okay. particular post so here is where so um, how did it determine that right so it basically said i looked at so many documents and so many domains were found um and then then i determined so many relationships right um work with a number of different let's look at it and then it. when you click and we can the, see here uh, the that there's a number of different so documents you would actually see the, watson for the documents that we fed to watson these were all the blogs or probably um if you look at the the mcafee blog or the pdf file that was talking about the the threat advisory related to the ransomware locky it was all ingested into watson and it's able to use that to determine that there is an association with locky malware um decision we can ask to the first stage of this okay. where watson and the advisor started with that single piece of information and first and if i could actually say that i've had this Yeah, suspicious event if i could actually say yeah. that so that's what before. i was talking about so what it does is it also pulls yeah. in suspicious event local context which basically says um yeah this laptop belongs to one of the partners who's currently working on i mean he's the intern that were hired to do certain things and it's not always a good thing that you know somebody like an intern went to a tar project or downloaded a malware or exe which is not always a uh, you know good thing right so It, it gives you the local context. Uh, this particular well. Excel document that somehow placed and executed just event looking at all the different right. categorized and what was pulled out data mining all of this himself but that was done automating this. And then and what you would see is that um you know in some cases what happens it also um as i told you these hashes these malware behavior are usually copied and replicated for other malware. So it also found an association with Drydex malware. and 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 in a bit you'll know that you know why we dropped the drydex node from the graph because it it sort of is irrelevant in this particular investigation um and so you found the relationship with with drydex and malware because you were able to see the tar project communication we kind of decided that the drydex malware was not relevant so we dropped that node from the final graph that we present to the analyst so it's basically a product of what we how we use watson
right? How we ease our bots into zero in on an incident. We take the, we mine the indicators locally, um, analyze, give it to Watson to analyze it, bring that back, uh, apply the local context, and then look at the connections. And and in this particular case, we took a suspicious activity, which was basically saying some exploit was, um, you know, some suspicious exploit was noticed, right? We took that simple thing, uh, we mined the indicators, and we were able to connect the behavior to a Lockheed malware campaign. And we also saw the other communications to the TAR project, um, you know, which kind of proved that it's most likely a ransomware, right? And and in this case, somebody can go ahead and, and open a resilient ticket, which is our integration into the product, right? So basically say, um, yeah, we, we basically can export this into a stick. Sticks is a standard where we document an attack. It has observables, indicators, everything captured in one document that any security guy would understand universally. Um, and we take that and send it to assignment. Resilient, that is. Okay, so that's the whole process. You start from an offense, um, ask Watson, bring that back, apply local context, drop the things that are not relevant, and then um, zero in on the, on the incident, open a resilient, resilient ticket, and close the fence. That's the life of a security analyst sitting on a, um, you know, sitting in a sock, trying to do his job. Um, I hope this was useful. A um, lot of this may have gone over your head just because, you know, it's, it's industry, but what I would like you to take back is the technologies that we use. We talk about cognition, we talked about graph databases, and how important is it to understand graph databases. If I show you a query that we do on, on a graph database, you would appreciate it, because the traversal is so complex that we start from a domain name, we see what it resolves to, an IP address, and we, we start from that IP address, go see if there are any connections to hashes, and see if those hashes are related to malware. And it's a, it's a, it's a traversal that's, that's pretty complicated. And that's, um, you know, that's something that you need to understand that, you know, well, yeah, we can use graph databases for doing these sorts of things, right? Th that's what I was telling you. Um, the DGA and other stuff, you know, it, 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 malware is so smart these days, you know, they, don't, they, they know how to bypass the defenses. It's, it's the signature-based stuff usually applies at a firewall or probably um, antivirus or IPS level where you're looking at certain network pattern and saying, okay, this is signature, belongs to, you know, malware, so let's block it, that kind of thing. This is after the fact. So this this really, I mean, any SIM is after the fact. It has crossed the first lines of defenses. It has affected your network, and SIM is capturing that behavior as anomalous or suspicious, and you're, taking invest you're doing investigation on top of it. Um, so Watson is not actually doing anything to relate with signatures, but... Um, if a certain virus signature captured it, right? Um, you know there are there are like good hundred or odd scanners out there. So if some scanners reported that uh, a particular hash was associated with certain malware, you know it's usually the case, right? Some of them are latest, some of them are behind the curve. Um, so Watson, because we are ingesting all that data into Watson, we know that you know if ten different virus scanners reported a hash to be associated with with a malware, then we are able to catch that, yeah. right? Okay, so we be teaching Watson what other people, I mean, what what's out there in the world already, right? And it's not signature-based matching as much as a more applying like a learning techniques. We teaching Watson that, oh, this virus scanner found out that this hash was associated with this malware. So if you see this hash in the investigation, uh, and you do, do your traversals or connections and then figure out um, and, and use that, uh, you know, the connection to establish the, the malicious association, right? It's not, not nothing to do with the virus signatures per se. Train new network, network and nanosh graph. So I'll tell you what I know. Um, and this is, every time somebody talks machine learning, you know, I tend to froth at my mouth. But the, for what it's worth, so there are a bunch of algorithms where you're giving certain, uh, there's, there's this, this concept of, um, uh, you know, training the graph, training the neural network itself, right? So, um, let me give you an example. Maybe it's better. Um, so you have um, you know certain classifications in the structure structured data, right? So certain observables belong to a certain part of cyber kill chain, for example. So if, if certain behavior is associated with, associated with exfiltration or command and control, right? 
So you would have those things in place. And, and that would have certain properties associated with it. So we teach the neural network saying, hey, I, these kind of IP addresses with these kind of properties are usually associated with command and control, right? Now you give a random IP address to it. And it looks at the properties of it. And since it learned stuff from what we ingested already, it's able to say that, yeah, this could be command and control. That's machine learning to me. But there's no reasoning behind that. It's more like algorithm mesh type than how a human would act. This is more about how a human would act. So you would usually learn, as a child, you would learn a language, right? As, as you grow up, you know, when, when, you, when, you, when I talked about the graph theory and all that, you picked up that thing and you won't forget it because you learned it. Machine learning is more based on the models, the patterns that it observed, apply an algorithm on top of it, and see if you can, you know, find the output based off of that. And there are, the input and output are sort of predetermined versus in a cognitive sense, it's not predetermined. No, knowledge graph is capturing the stuff. It's capturing, it's like how your brain is connecting to it, right? So if you, if I say selection, right? So how would you connect to me? So you would connect to uh, that lady out there and then say, yeah, this girl invited me to, to, this, to this ACM conference and I'm from IBM. So there's some connection to IBM through you, right, something like that. So all these connections are put in a graph and you're, you're able to reason behind why I'm here, right? That. So cognition is, is really about applying those techniques which would learn, reason, and act upon it, right? Machine learning is a totally different thing. Machine learning is this, I would call it a hunch because uh, you're, you're throwing certain data out there, it, applying an algorithm on that pattern and trying to get an output uh, you know, you, 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 you know, right, you adjust the weights on the network and you somehow get this output. You do this 10 times, the 11th time you could be right is the perception there, right? And that's why machine learning is pretty expensive. It's not, uh, if you give it like data that's 100% you know, malicious, every time you throw something at it, it'll say it's malicious. But if you give it a mix of data, right, and, and then ask a question, it'll probably be able to, re, you know, find the right pattern behind it but it's still finding pattern based on what it's thought, right? what, it's, um, what it's been given, the data set that was used. Um, there are different techniques, but I've probably talked about one of the techniques in machine learning there. Um, but, but cognition, I mean, this is different. Don't confuse with cognition and, uh, and machine learning, right? So you can apply machine learning on top of cognition, but this is not essentially machine learning. Good question. I mean, this is the question that one of the customers asked, right? Uh, when we go sell these products, right, there are competitive products out there which just says, oh, I use machine learning to determine this, so what do you do? I said, well, two different things. Don't, don't mix these things, right? We're trying to, um, trying to help a human. Uh, like, nobody can replace a human brain, obviously. And the only challenge is that the human brain cannot, um, it's, not, it's, it's impossible to stay on top of things. And that's why you're using a machine to, to substitute a human brain, right? It can never reason and a machine can never replace a human brain. So, so Watson is all about getting there, making a machine as intelligent as, as a human. It's just, you know, we will get there because this challenge was thrown at us two years ago. We're still not there. We still are not there at a point where we could basically say, um, uh, we be as accurate as a human can be looking at the same set of data. Right? It's still a lot of information is being thrown at analysts. It reduced his time, but you know, it did not replace him. Just like we can't replace doctors, right? A lot of people do Google before, the, you know, whenever they get symptoms, I have headache. Oh, by the way, I have also this, let me Google, and you know, take some medication, right? It's a very dangerous thing. You can replace a doctor. You just can. And, and just, just like that, you know, you can use an assistant to tell a doctor that I looked at these studies which were relevant to this. So it helps the doctor look at the same studies and make a decision. But it, you can't make a decision. The machine cannot make a decision for the patient there. You got to, you got to remember that. Is this an open source project? Uh, there are certain parts which are open source. Um, and you know, if you're interested that to, to, to look at it, I could uh, you know, get you connected there. Um, but Watson itself is some, some sort of a trademark system from IBM. Um, the certain portions of it which you could use to build a cognitive system. Um, I wouldn't even go there. I would actually go on to IBM Cloud. Um, so IBM Cloud has this Watson API. So 
uh, one of the interesting things is, uh, you know, sentiment analysis, right? So when I get a manager from an email with, with some sort of uh, directions and stuff, I stick it in Watson and it'll tell you, this guy has a negative mood, by the way, right? So that kind of thing. So uh, it's fun, just, just uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure you write emails, right? Or yeah. mostly WhatsApp, or take a WhatsApp message, stick it in Watson, and see what the tone of the user, tone of the speaker was, the guy who wrote. So it's interesting insights into, you know, the, uh, uh, it gives you uh, the tone, it gives you certain other characteristics of that particular text. So there's text analysis, um, and that, that's an easier one, but there are a lot more complicated stuff related to accounting and extrapolations and all that. So ingest some data, use those APIs. I would start there. Go to IBM Cloud, go to Watson APIs, and see if you can use two or three of them to build your smart application, right? Right. Uh, like, for example, um, you know, maybe, maybe this is a challenge for you, right? So you, you, you write, um, you write es essays for your answers, right, or something like that. So um, see if, if Watson can analyze and see if it's correct or not, right? See if you, what would, that's, what would Watson score you versus what your teacher scores you, things like that. They could build a cognitive application, essentially remove evaluation as a, from your, you know, as a job of teacher, right? They do look at your papers. Maybe Watson can look at it one day. This is public. Yeah, so the difference between, um, I mean, Shriek spoke at length about IBM Cloud, and I don't want to uh, steal words from his mouth, but um, IBM Cloud is a platform. It's called Cloud and Cognitive Platform. So if you look at AWS or Amazon and Google Cloud, you know, they don't talk about any of these things. A lot of people talk about big data, machine learning, all that crap. But the differentiator between IBM Cloud and the other clouds are we are a cognitive platform. If you build an application, build a cognitive layer below it. Yeah, you'll have infrastructure, you'll have algorithms, you'll have application logic, but you have to build it on top of a cognitive layer, um, and 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 that's when you 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 know you're ahead of the game, right? So IBM Cloud is the platform where you build, you can build a cognitive application. So I would start there because you don't want to reinvent the cycle, right? Get the fundamentals right, understand what cognition is, right? Through your coursework or whatever. And then apply that in uh, using the cloud, leverage the cloud, and build an application that you could think of for your probably an undergrad project or something like that, right? Um, I'm sure you know your faculty should get in touch with uh, the industry and talk about changing the curriculum to include more um, cognitive stuff because um, it's, it's it's we're betting on it big time, right? Because that's the differentiator. I hope this was useful. Um, thank you.